Welcome back everybody to another reaction video. We're doing something pretty different than what you typically see uh, in my reaction videos. Uh, number one, because we are taking a look at a Yarn Hub video for the first time. Now we've seen Yarn Hub on the channel before in the form of their videos that go with Sabaton songs. So for example, uh, when I watched and reacted to Sabaton's song, uh, on the story of Charlie Brown and Franz Stigler, uh, the story of the B-17 that was escorted uh, out of uh, German airspace. That was a yarn hub video that went along with that Sabaton song. Uh, but this is the first time I'm going directly to their site to react to a video. And unlike a lot of our other videos, which have centered around major world conflicts and different things like that, or monarchies, today we're going to take a look at the story of Billy the Kid. Now, this is something I've known a little bit about. Uh, I first fell in love with learning about the Old West through a couple of movies, uh, Young Guns and Young Guns 2, which are kind of somewhat fictionalized versions of the story of Billy the Kid and the Lincoln County War. And then, of course, the movies Wyatt Earp and Tombstone, which told a different part of the story of the Old West uh, centered around uh, the Earps. Uh, but we're going to watch this. I haven't seen it yet, and hopefully some of what I know about Billy the Kid and his story is going to come back to me as we react to this. If you like this, make sure you check out the original content creator. They've got a lot of great stuff. It's all animated, all tells good stories, lesser known stories sometimes uh, from history. So I'll put a link in the description to the original content. Make sure you check them out. Let's dive in. It's February the 18th, 1878, and William H. Bonney, also to be known as Billy the Kid, is out riding drag 300 yards behind his boss, John Tunstall, somewhere in Lincoln County. Billy hears two shots, and John Tunstall, who is also his friend and his mentor, falls from his horse, cut down by a gang of men known as the Boys. Billy races up to his fallen friend. Stricken with grief and anger, Billy says, before this is done, I'm gonna get some of them. As a young boy, Billy lived in Silver City, New Mexico, with his mother and stepfather. Living in New Mexico, Billy immersed himself into the local culture. He learned to speak Spanish fluently and could even pass as a Mexican and was well liked by the Hispanic community. So let's talk for a second about what we know about Billy the Kid's history. First of all, his name was almost certainly not Billy and it wasn't William H. Bonney. Most historians, I think, generally agree that his name was most likely Henry McCarty. Uh, that he was born in New York City, I think in like 1859. We don't know a lot about his background. I believe his mother was uh, born in Ireland. Um, and we know a little bit more about his mother than we do about who his father was. We really don't know for sure who his father was. But yeah, they end up in, uh, in New Mexico territory when he's a teenager. Uh, I think his mother ends up dying and he ends up kind of out on his own. Uh, if you've seen the movie Young Guns, which stars Emilio Estevez as Billy the Kid, one of the things that they get horribly wrong in that story is John Tunstall. Uh, and that's the guy that Billy kind of is mentored by. And in the movie... Uh, he's played by an older gentleman uh, and kind of shown as like this father figure. Now, it's true that John Tunstall kind of became like a father figure, but he was only in his mid-20s, I think. He was an English immigrant. I believe he was English. Uh, at a time when most of Lincoln County in that area was controlled by the Irish. And so you have this kind of English versus Irish thing going on. Uh, and he gets kind of caught in the middle of it. Or maybe he was the Irish one. I don't remember for sure. Let me look it up. No, that's right. Uh, so Tunstall was the English one. He was born in London. And uh, yeah, he's competing against the Irish. And that's really what his murder came down to. And they basically framed it like... They tried to make it look like Tunstall was in the wrong so they could justify it. And it was probably ordered by the Lincoln County Sheriff. And he becomes the target for Billy the Kid. Billy and his brother played with the other children in the town and were remembered fondly. Because he was small and somewhat girlish looking, he was frequently a target of bullying. His friends later recalled that he was not loud, but easygoing, loyal and courteous, and very, very brave. In 1874, Billy's mother Catherine lost her battle with tuberculosis and died. His stepfather, William Antrim, effectively abandoned the two boys and moved to Arizona. Billy was just 14 and entered a boarding house. He made friends with a small-time crook called Sombrero Jack. Billy's life was to change dramatically when Sombrero Jack robbed a Chinese laundry. He asked Billy to hold on to the swag and store it in the boarding house. 
it was discovered by Mrs. Brown, the owner, who reported it to the sheriff. Sombrero Jack skipped town, but Billy was captured and imprisoned, but only for two days. While in prison, he convinced the sheriff to let him out in order to stretch his legs. The main door to the prison was locked all the time, so the sheriff thought there was no risk. However, as soon as his back was turned, Billy squeezed into the fireplace and up the chimney and escaped across the roof of the prison. So this is not the last time that Billy escapes dramatically from the law, and I'm sure they'll talk about the story later on. Uh, but uh, he had he was known to have um, fat wrists and small hands, and so he could slip out of handcuffs easily. Uh, and yeah, he was very he very small, very frail kind of frame, and that allowed him to do things like sneak up a, um, a furnace uh, up through a fireplace and, and through a chimney. You could say that this was the start of Billy's fame, as his story made it to the papers, with the Silver City Herald publishing the story of the robbery. Now on the run and desperate, he traveled by stagecoach to his stepfather's home in Arizona. Billy told him of the robbery, and Antrim threw him out. But not before Billy could steal some clothes and guns. The two men never saw each other again. In Camp Grant, there was a blacksmith called Frank Windy Cahill. Windy would frequently bully the kid. On August the 18th, 1877, the kid was in Atkins Cantina when Windy Cahill decided to humiliate him. It was to be the last time. In the struggle, Billy managed to work one arm free and grabbed his 45. A shot rang out and the giant blacksmith slumped, never to rise. Billy worked himself free, sprang out the door of the cantina and jumped on a horse riding into the distance. With the blacksmith's death hanging over him, Billy headed back to New Mexico and joined up with the most infamous band of rustlers who were known as the Boys. Their leader was Jesse Evans and his sidekick was John Kinney, king of the rustlers. The Boys began working for the house. Wait, 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 wait a second. Can we just take a moment and appreciate the DeLorean sitting here from... Uh, this is from uh, Back to the Future. Okay, that's pretty impressive. The house was a hugely influential business, selling goods, land, and cattle. One of the heads of the house was James Dolan. He was an Irish immigrant and was a hard businessman that was feared and wouldn't let anything get in his way, including the law and the local sheriff, Brady, who was on the payroll of the house. Yeah, so the Murphy-Dolan gang, uh, gang becomes the, the big rivals in what they call the Lincoln County War, which is between Billy the Kid and his crew, although Billy the Kid wasn't really the leader of that crew, uh, and the Murphy-Dolan gang. Uh, and yeah, uh, the sheriff, w Sheriff Brady was in on the whole thing. He was on the payroll of the kind of the Irish side of things. A wealthy young Englishman, John Tunstall, arrived in Lincoln County, New Mexico, and decided he could outwit the locals by setting up his own monopoly with his own store and cattle. Tunstall's business impacted the profitability of the house and put him directly in the path of James Dolan, and the two became bitter enemies. Dolan got Billy and the boys to steal horses from Tunstall. They were caught and Billy was imprisoned. Tunstall visited Billy in jail and they hit it off. Tunstall offered Billy a job working for him and the kid accepted. He was only six years older than Billy, but Billy respected the man and saw him as a mentor. Yep. For the first time since his mother's death, the kid found himself at home. He was welcomed in and became firm friends with Tunstall and his employees, one of which would later remember about Billy. He was the center of interest everywhere he went, and though heavily armed, he seemed as gentlemanly as a college-bred youth. Yeah, that's the thing about Billy the Kid. Everybody who met him liked him. Uh, he seemed to have a very kind of magnetic personality that drew people to him. Uh, the one for sure photograph that we have of Billy is not real flattering and doesn't make him look all that great. Uh, in terms of his looks, but most people described him as a, a fairly attractive guy. Uh, and, you know, people were just drawn to him. He had an infectious laugh. Um, and so I think that's part of the reason why he was able to get away so many times and hide so often, because he did make a lot of friends along the way, despite the things that he was doing. He quickly became acquainted with everyone, and because of his humorous and pleasing personality, grew to be a community favorite. The Tunstall group were out riding, with Billy guarding the rear about 300 yards behind. When a flock of turkeys got the attention of the two men riding with Tunstall, they headed off with their rifles to bag dinner. It was at that moment a posse of men, Billy's old gang, the boys, appeared and shot Tunstall. Billy was left, grieving over his friend, but swearing revenge. 
Knowing Sheriff Brady was on the side of the house, Billy went to the Justice of the Peace, a man called Wilson, who issued arrest warrants for the assassins. Wilson assigned a Constable Martinez to help with the arrest. He deputized Billy and Billy's friend Dick Brewer to help him fulfill the warrant. For the first time, Billy the Kid had the law on his side, or so he thought. And so a lot of times what happens in the Old West is these are territories, they're not yet states. Um, it's a very loose kind of government system that's happening. Not a lot of control from back east in Washington and things like that. And so, uh, and this happens again uh, with the shootout at the OK Corral uh, in Arizona and Tombstone, where you have county officials, you have uh, federal government officials, you have territory officials. And so sometimes you'll have people on competing sides who are both given some kind of authority by the law, whether it's, you know, local or state or, you know, well, no state, but local or federal. Uh, and they both kind of claim to have the authority on their side. The three men rode into town and went straight to Dolan's store to arrest the assassins. Sheriff Brady was waiting for them and arrested the constable, Billy and Dick. The constable was released after a few hours, but Billy and Dick were kept in prison and missed the funeral of John Tunstall. When the men were finally released, they went back to the justice of the peace. He was frustrated at the sheriff obstructing the law in this way, and so he deputized Dick Brewer to fulfill the warrant. Brewer formed up his posse from friends of Tunstall, Regulators. and that of course included Billy. They called themselves the Regulators. The Regulators then embarked upon a campaign of severe retribution against the men responsible for the death of John Tunstall. So yeah, and one of the one of the really cool scenes in the movie, um, Young Guns, is when they take on Buckshot Roberts, who they portray as this, and I don't know if he was or not, this kind of aging, has been, but still really tough uh, shootout artist, and uh, he ends up killing Dick Brewer uh, in the middle of all. I think it was Dick Brewer he kills, uh, who's played by Charlie Sheen, uh, who's Emilio Estevez's brother. Uh, and yeah, so they do go on this kind of path of retribution, which culminates in them taking down Sheriff Brady. They took no prisoners. They knew that the law would not prosecute anyone they brought to justice. And so they took it upon themselves to serve justice swiftly and directly. They even hid behind a wall, ambushed and killed Sheriff Brady and his deputy. So in the, um, you know, I've read some places that people claim that what they did was they hid behind this wall and they, they drilled holes through the wall so that they could shoot through. But it's very unlikely that it happened that way because, number one, the walls were pretty thick. These adobe walls that they would have been, you know, and plus you're limiting your field of fire. He, he pretty much did what you see here uh, shown as he came out into the street and, and did it kind of in the open in front of everybody. Everybody knew that it was the regulators, in particular Billy the Kid, who had killed Sher Sheriff Brady. The regulators did not escape without casualties, with Billy being wounded in the side and the loss of his friend, Dick Brewer. With lawlessness in Lincoln County and the situation becoming more notorious, Washington got involved. The government appointed a new governor, Lou Wallace, who revoked the legal status of the regulators, and they effectively became outlaws. So this guy, I mean, this is a good animation. He looks just like Lou Wallace. So Lou Wallace is a uh, former Union general, uh, famous for his um, tardiness at the Battle of Shiloh, but also uh, served later in the war and did very well, uh, in particular places like the Battle of Monocacy, which he lost but delayed the Confederates long enough to uh, reinforce Washington, D.C. Uh, after the war, he becomes a territorial governor of New Mexico. He's probably best known as the author of the book Ben-Hur, about which there have been at least, I think, two movies made now. And Billy was indicted for the death of Sheriff Brady. The Lincoln County War came to a climax when Billy and the Regulators were holed up in a house in Lincoln next to Tunstall's store. The house belonged to Tunstall's lawyer. James Dolan and his men surrounded the house and a siege began. But this time, Dolan enlisted the support of the military from Fort Stanton. Billy stepped forward as a leader and put together a plan. At 9 p.m., they dashed out of separate exits and made a run for it. Billy and some of the Regulators made their daring escape into the darkness. From now on, it would be Billy who would shoulder the blame for the Lincoln County War. He was a wanted man. So I believe it was Alexander McSween's store is what they were held up in. And McSween was actually killed, I think, during that fight. Uh, and, and he was another one of those allies that Billy the Kid and others had uh, who had largely stayed 
on the legal side of things and wasn't an outlaw, but got caught in the middle of all of it just like everybody else. And yeah, the military was involved. Uh, and, and at this point, Billy, he, he's on the run permanently and he is always going to be an outlaw. Um, contrary to popular belief, I do not believe they ever actually had a wanted poster for Billy the Kid. Uh, he was not nearly as famous during his lifetime as people think he was. He was famous locally in uh, New Mexico territory, uh, in particular in Lincoln County, but it wasn't like people all over the country knew the story of Billy the Kid. He was front page headlines everywhere, things like that. The Kid and his regulators managed to steal some horses and escape. They rode to Fort Sumner. Fort Sumner was an old army fort that was no longer occupied by the army, but was now populated by Mexicans. It was an ideal spot for the regulators to hide out. Billy was at home with the Mexicans and the men partied and danced with the local girls. Some of the regulators were tired of life on the run and left the group. The time of the regulators was over. The new governor had offered amnesty to the combatants of the Lincoln County War. However, as Billy had been identified as the killer of the sheriff, he was excluded from the amnesty. He didn't qualify for the pardon, and so the only choice he had to live a somewhat peaceful life was to make amends with his former enemies. Billy rode back into Lincoln County to parley with James Dolan and the house. The meeting was tense, but they agreed a truce. After the truce was signed, the men celebrated by drinking. Another, another reference to uh, Back to the Future there is a wanted poster for Mad Dog Tannen. That's awesome. Signed, the men celebrated by drinking. Billy held back from drinking, but accompanied Dolan and his Frisbee men as they headed out onto the street. While on the street, they encountered Huston Chapman. Chapman was an attorney who was going after the house. Billy knew a fight was brewing and tried to get away, but was stopped by Dolan's men. Chapman was shot and killed. At the first opportunity, Billy made his excuses and rode out of town. The governor was outraged at the shooting of Chapman. Bill arranged a meeting with the governor and promised to submit himself for arrest and yep. testify in court against Dolan and his men. Wallace said, in return for your doing this, I will let you go scot-free with a pardon in your pocket for all your misdeeds. So this is a dramatic moment, but it's also one of those turning point moments. Here's Billy the Kid, who's an outlaw, who's wanted for murdering a sheriff, meeting face to face with the governor of the territory and getting a face to face promise from him that he would be pardoned in exchange for his testimony. And had that been followed through on and upheld, I think Billy the Kid's story goes in a very different direction. Uh, I'm not saying that Billy, Billy the Kid wasn't naturally prone to kind of being an outlaw. But a lot of it was the life, the circumstances of his life around him. And it seemed like every time he tried to kind of go straight, every time he tried to have an, a normal life and do the right thing, circumstances around him uh, kind of propelled him in another direction. Now, he still made his own choices. And he always chose revenge and chose to, you know, to, to do the, the things outside the law. But I, I wonder sometimes how his life might have been different if this had gone a different way. They had a deal. Billy had his day in court and lived up to his end of the bargain. His enemies were furious. After the trial was over, Governor Wallace shunned Billy and headed back to Santa Fe to finish writing his book, Ben-Hur. Betrayed, Billy had no pardon and his enemies were out to get him. Caught between the law and the lawless, he walked out of jail and went back to the life he knew best. He set up a gang and became an outlaw. Pat Garrett, an exceptionally tall, thin man, an ex-buffalo hunter and cowboy was elected as sheriff of Lincoln County. He was determined to bring Bill to justice. Garrett tracked Billy to a place called Stinking Spring. So they skipped over, I think, one of the most dramatic parts of the story. They say he walked out of jail. What actually happens is, uh, if I understand the story right, he gets a hold of a gun that had been hidden for him, I think maybe in the outhouse, and he pulls the gun first on the... Um, on the deputy sheriff, I think his name was Bell. And he liked Bell and, and, and didn't want to hurt him, but Bell pulled on him and he shot him and killed him. Um, and then I want to say Bob Ollinger is the name of the, the sheriff in town uh, after that that he ends up killing. And he's up in a window or something and he yells out when he sees Bob coming across. He says, hello, Bob. And Bob looks up at him and he shoots him and he says, goodbye, Bob. 
Uh, I don't know how much of that's true, but that's the story I've read, and that's how they portray it in the movie Young Guns 2. Um, but yeah, he does. He escapes after he had been actually sentenced to death. Uh, and they kind of skip all o over that here, but he was. He was sentenced to death, and he was awaiting his execution when he escaped. Uh, and yeah, he gets tracked down, I think it's in July of 1881, to Stinking Springs by Pat Garrett, who there was a big bounty out for Billy the Kid at that point. Springs. They surrounded the house where the gang were holed up, and they surrendered. Billy was convicted and imprisoned in Lincoln. Okay, you know what? I'm getting ahead of myself. It was after he captures Billy and his gang that the notorious thing happens with the breakout from jail, and it's later on in July of 1881 when he gets killed. Well, a scaffold was built. The kid had escaped from many prisons, and this one couldn't hold him either. While Garrett was out of town, Billy managed to escape, shooting two deputies in the process. Amazingly, he didn't leave town straight away. He danced in the streets celebrating and even chatted to the locals. Many people still liked Billy and had sympathy for him. One townsman thought he should stop Billy and went to get his gun, but his wife stopped him and probably saved his life. Yeah. So Billy had his uninterrupted celebration of freedom before ordering a horse be brought to him and riding out of town. The next day, Garrett returned to the mayhem that Billy had left behind. He must have been furious, but he coldly calculated what he had to do next. He knew Billy would go to ground and be impossible to track, so he did nothing, just waited until Billy felt comfortable and surfaced once more. Billy had many lovers, but he was very close to Paulita Maxwell, sister of Pete Maxwell, who lived in Fort Sumner. Pat Garrett started to receive information that Billy was in Fort Sumner, and Garrett headed there to get his man. On July the 14th, 1881, Garrett and his deputy made their way into Fort Sumner and went to Pete Maxwell's house. Garrett knew Maxwell, they had worked together before and were friends. Garrett woke Pete Maxwell and they talked with Garrett sat on the bed. Pete admitted that Billy was in town and exactly at that moment, Billy appeared in the doorway. The room was dark, but Maxwell said, that's him. Two shots were fired and at the age of 21, Billy the Kid fell. Years later, his deputies would claim, due to the dark room, that Garrett had killed the wrong man. In so yeah, there's a lot of those stories that always crop up when these situations arise, with people claiming that they were really Billy the Kid, that he wasn't really killed by Pat Garrett. And of course, these claims happen after Pat Garrett himself was killed a number of years later. He was murdered while going to the bathroom, uh, like on the side of the road. And... Um, after that, when Pat Garrett's not around to give his side of the story and, and you know things like that, uh, and it's impossible to check now for sure because we don't really know for sure where Billy the Kid's body is, the place where he was buried, there was flooding, and the body may have been washed away, so they just really don't know where it is, so they can't do a DNA test with the body to compare it to his mother's body anything like that to really prove one way or the other but there was an old man that claimed to have been billy the kid many years later and wanted a pardon things like that in 1948 an old timer called brushy bill roberts began correspondence with a lawyer he said he was billy the kid and requested the lawyer's help to get the pardon that he was still owed he could demonstrate how to get out of handcuffs, had 26 bullet and knife marks on his body. Even more interestingly, several contemporaries of Billy the Kid signed affidavits confirming that Brushy Bill really was, in fact, the most famous gunslinger of the Old West, Billy the Kid. His mission to gain a pardon was unsuccessful and treated as a joke. About four weeks after the application was thrown out, Brushy Bill passed away, never receiving his pardon. So yeah, Billy the Kid's story is a fascinating one. He didn't kill 21 people in 20 in his, for his 21 years of life. A lot of what people claim about him is really kind of the stuff of legend. But it is really a fascinating story about the direction one's life can go depending on the circumstances around you and what you get yourself caught up in. Uh, and it's a fascinating one and one that I think I'd kind of have a, an itch to kind of dive back into and learn a little bit more about. So I'm sure some of you out there know a lot more about this story than I do. So please add your thoughts uh, to the comment section below. Let me know. Make sure you check out the original video. We'll see you again soon. Thanks for watching.